Welcome back to tracing part two, everyone. So basically, we're just going to continue where we left off. Uh, in fact, I think I sort of like rushed through this like selecting variables example. So I'd like to say like a, a little bit actually about the result. So um, do you remember? So I was talking about this model of tracing attacks where you have this data set. And what you've been given is just like the names of the columns that are most biased. So you know, within these, these D columns in this data set, there are like some columns, like you know, this one, that one, and that one, that are like most biased. And these are in some sense like the interesting columns under some definition of interesting. And, um, and, and so you're given the names of those columns. And I claimed that basically there's this phenomenon in which sort of as the space from which the columns were chosen, as D goes, gets much, you know, gets very large, these columns somehow contain like more information that I can use to infer membership in the data. And the way the attack works is similar to what we had before, but we have to modify it a little bit because I don't even have you know, numbers, I don't have the mean of anything, I just have the names of the columns. And so the attack is, is actually like somehow even simpler. You just, you get your target individual, right? Your target individual is some, you know, long like D bits of data. And what you do is you just sort of pick out the columns that you were told were interesting and you just sum up the bits in those columns. You just take the sum and you just ask yourself, is it big or is it small? Or some significance threshold. And, and like intuitively what you would expect is that, you know, if these are somehow like large columns of the data set, then people who are in the data set should give you large values on these columns. And what you need to show is that in fact they do and they give you larger values than people who are not in the data set. So, uh, I'll give you sort of a sketch of the analysis for the case where the data is uniform. So in the case where the target is independent of the data set, what's going on is you're just looking at the sum over the, select, sum over the selected columns of the bits the target individual has in those positions. And because T is independent of the data set and thus the selected columns. This is the sum of k fair coin tosses. Okay, and by you know, Hofting bound, the probability that the sum of k fair coin tosses is bigger than this quantity, square root 2k ln 1 over delta, smaller than delta. Okay. So it's very simple. I mean, you drew people randomly. Now you draw a new fresh guy randomly. Doesn't matter which columns you look at. You're just summing up random data. So very simple. Now, in the case where the person is in the data set, then the way to think about it is that you started with some very high dimensional uniform data. And now very roughly what's happening is someone has like told you that there's like a skinny submatrix in here that is very biased. Right? Someone said like I've found a set of these columns on which the average is much higher than zero. Like the mean of these columns is much larger than zero. And of course what that means is that when you sum up the, you know, if you take a random person from the data set, if you look at like a random person here, then the sum, like the mean of that sum is going to be equal to the bias on these S columns. So the question is basically what is the bias of the top K columns? Like if I take a data set uniformly with D columns, and now I look at the K largest columns, like how big are the K largest columns? And uh, sort of the useful fact is that uh, if x is chosen uniformly at random, then the 
k largest columns have mean at least the square root log d over k over n. You can just get this by studying like the tails of the binomial distribution. It's not like a tremendously hard thing to prove, although the, the proof is not like particularly insightful, so I won't do it. But what does that mean? That means that when the target is in the data set, this is now a sum of coin tosses where each coin toss has mean about this quantity. And so the mean here is about k times that quantity, the linearity of expectation. And so if you work out the parameters, you get that you know, kind of k gamma is bigger than the threshold uh, when kind of k log d over k is bigger than n log 1 over delta. And that's basically where the theorem comes from. So it's basically just by understanding how biased are the columns that you've selected relative to their, you know, the population mean. And I'll make a, like a point here. So this is yet another example where like, you know, overfitting is really like the problem, right? So this analysis relies on the idea that I have like chosen the data specifically to have nothing interesting in it. Like the mean is zero. So like, you know, you have found nothing. Like what you should say if you're like a statistician is like, I looked at my data set and you know, I did not reject the null hypothesis H0 for like any of these columns. You know, this was a waste of time. I'm really sorry. I'm gonna give back the NIH's money and you know, I'm sure that's how it would happen. Uh, so, you know, like this is like sort of a really interesting problem where it seems intuitive that like actually doing something statistically valid, like sort of only identifying columns that are like like truly statistically significantly large would somehow actually like help you for privacy in a slightly like inherent way. And in fact, if you do know that there are columns that are like that really stand out from the others, like the, there's K columns that are much bigger than the others or are much more biased than the others, using these sort of stability based methods, you can, you can get very accurate private algorithms. So I think there's like a lot of interesting questions here about sort of like when is selection bad, when is selection kind of not, not bad. Uh, one can probably formalize bad and not bad appropriately. Okay, so that's a little more about selection. So let me move on to talking about robust tracing attacks, which uh, is the extension of this tracing attack to the setting where you're allowed to add kind of a lot of noise to the mean in some sort of attempt to ensure privacy. And what we want to understand is both, you know, how well do the attacks work? So in some sense, like if you are a, a practitioner or you are setting policy, and someone said, you know, okay, I heard about this Homer et al. tracing attack, and I heard that it only works if I release the true mean. So I, instead of releasing the true mean, I, you know, released the true mean where I rounded the answers to one in a, multiples of one in a thousand. And their attack doesn't say anything. Right? So we want to basically understand, like, uh, you know, what will the attack do if you actually run it on, like, various attempts to ensure privacy? And of course, in the limit, what we'd like to prove and what we'll sort of establish is kind of a, a threshold effect, that there's sort of the amount of noise that ensures differential privacy, and below that, this attack will sort of succeed no matter what you do. Uh, so that'll have kind of nice implications for privacy. So, okay, so we talked about the exact mean. So let's talk about, you know, let's, let's get sort of a feel for like what I, like what statements I can make about running this attack on noisy data. Um, so the first question, right, is like, Let's just calibrate what we can hope for. Like we know that if you add enough noise, like you can get differential privacy. So let's just calibrate what, what you can do. So you know, quiz, if you're gonna learn like one thing, you know, if you're gonna remember like one thing from, from this week, if I want to release the mean of a d-dimensional data set and I want to use you know, independent Laplace noise, how much noise do I have to add to each coordinate from a, from a Laplace distribution? Don't make me call on Katrina. <laughs> yeah, 
Hey, like, what's the sensitivity of, of each entry of the mean? Come on, come on. 2 over n, right? So if I, have, if I wanted to release one entry of the mean, I would add Laplace noise 2 over n. Now I want to compose overall d coordinates. How much, more no like, how much noise do I have to add to each? Right, so if I wanted, if I used sort of vanilla composition, I would add noise d over n. If I use advanced composition, it suffices to add noise square root d over n to each coordinate. Okay, so this is just a fancy, uh, some fancy notation. So right, the baseline algorithm we need to keep in mind is that if I'm allowed to add noise about square root d over n to each entry, then I'm gonna get differential privacy. So there's you know, no hope for a tracing attack in this case. So the interesting question, of course, is like, what happens when you add less noise? Um, fix, you know, epsilon equals one for now. Epsilon equals one is enough to prevent a tracing attack, so let's just fix it and, and keep, uh, you know, keep, keep things clean. I'm also dropping delta. And, um, good, so we've sort of this baseline, and like, what I want to focus on is just this like qualitative behavior that, you know, if d, if the dimension of the data is smaller than n squared, we get some non-trivial approximation to the mean. Like the error will be smaller than one. Whereas if the dimension of this data is n squared, like if this data is like really, really fat, we get like total nonsense. We're gonna add noise bigger than one, and might as well have just estimated the mean to be zero. So you know, like qualitatively, like the question that, you know, uh, sort of the first question that like, you know, we were sort of asking is like, can you do anything when D is bigger than, than N squared? Like when you have a data set that's, you know, so much fatter than it is tall, can you get even the mean of it? Like, you know, can you hope for anything? So I'll tell you the answer is no, but like, when I tell you the answer is no, what you're probably guessing is that I can generalize the theorem from before in a sort of like one-to-one -one way. Like, you sort of would guess that I can get, uh, you know, this very nice theorem that says kind of, all right, under the same assumptions I had before, if I release a mean that's noisy and each entry has like alpha error and the dimension is bigger than about alpha squared n squared, so why am I saying alpha squared n squared? I'm just taking the bound we had for differential privacy and like solving for d. You could also solve for n if you want, they're all the same. Okay, so you would think that I get this nice theorem that says uh, exactly what we had before. I have kind of a, I can distinguish people who are you know, outside of the data set from random people who are in the data set with probability uh, one minus delta. Okay, like that's, that's like what you would like want to prove. You'd want to say under the same assumptions, if I have like a big enough D and you don't, you know, don't add enough noise to achieve differential privacy, then I can, I can do membership inference like you know, in the usual sort of pack learning sense. Like you give me a random person, I classify them as in or out with probability one minus delta. Now, this is not true. Like this is a false theorem. And it's instructive to like understand sort of like why this theorem somehow like can't be true. Like I think it's sort of very like meaningful for thinking about attacks and also for just thinking about like lower bounds and privacy and like what is hard in privacy. So like why can't this theorem be true? And I claim that like it can be true for very small alpha but somehow can't be true when alpha is like much bigger than root n. And the reason is the following. So Right, so I said, you know, your data set, like you should think of your data set as drawn from a population, and your data set is like samples from that population that gives you some estimate of the population mean. But of course, we can also view the data set as a population, and we can sample from the data set. Okay, like that's a pretty good way to estimate the mean of the data. And one can show by, you know, like a sort of Hofting argument, I think Kobe probably worked out the most analogous statement in his uh, learning theory talk, that and if you sample about log d over alpha squared rows of the data set at random, then you take their mean and you call that 
Q hat, like that's your noisy mean, then that will actually be within about alpha. So like, wh what does this tell us? So this does not tell us that it's like easy to achieve privacy. Like this is not a good way to achieve privacy. It's like exactly the kind of thing we like didn't want when we, you know, introduce differential privacy. Like we don't want algorithms where you just take somebody's data and like sacrifice it on the altar of utility and uh, you know, everyone who got lucky enough not to be in the sample is fine and like that person is, you know, destitute and has lost their health insurance and, and everything. So this is not a private algorithm. However, it like clearly falsifies the theorem that I like wrote on the board before because you know suppose I give you a random person from X. Well, if I give you a random person from X, there's a pretty good chance that they're like not in the subsample, and if they're not in the subsample, then like this mean Q hat is totally independent of their data. So there's literally like no difference between those people and the people who were drawn from the population. Right? So like. You know, this person who wasn't sampled is like no different from like the person in the cloud, P. They're totally the same. Okay, so this doesn't mean that like you get privacy just by subsampling, but what it means is that we have to like refine the theorem. We, we can't somehow like do membership inference with this strong guarantee that we actually kind of like detect everyone in the data set. We're gonna have to settle for some guarantee that says, you know, there's someone in the data set that we detect, or maybe many people in the data set we detect, um, and you know, uh, we'll have to take that as our privacy violation. Of course, it's you know, if you're that person, like you don't really you don't really care about the difference between that privacy violation and what we had before, so uh, it's still good. And of course, you know, one can show still violates differential privacy. Okay, so that's just that statement. Now, there's like one other like tricky thing about the way I stated the theorem before. So like, if you remember the way I stated the theorem before, like, I, you know, I proved the theorem just for the case where P is uniform. And I said that like the whole thing that's going on is like, P is just some like fixed distribution. So like, in some sense, you don't even want the mean of the data set anyway. You just wanted the mean of the distribution. And the attack was like really just relying on the fact that I was like, you know, in the model, you like released the mean of the distribution, which was already somehow overfit to the data set. So, the reason that works is because we required like zero error, right? Like we required zero error, and requiring zero error kind of forces you to like output some function that depends on the data set in like a very like sensitive way. But if I'm allowing you to add like even a fairly small amount of error, then by kind of like the same argument we had before, it would suffice to just output the population mean. Like if the population mean is just like zero, I can defeat the attack by outputting zero instead of outputting the data set mean Q. And using like exactly the same argument we had before, if the data set consists of NIID samples, then every row of the data set is within about, you know, square root one over N of the corresponding mean in the population. So if I'm allowing you to have more than square root n error, then uh, you know, it's not gonna be possible to argue that membership inference succeeds even for like a fixed distribution. You're gonna have to critically use the fact that like the distribution itself is not known. Like this is not a real algorithm. Like you don't know the population mean. Right? It's, this is just a, like, it's just an important point about why the population itself must be random. Yeah, yeah, exactly, well we showed it, right? I mean, so for zero, so, so in fact, I, I guess I maybe didn't write this anywhere on the slide, but like, you know, so when I, for zero error, we showed it. For error, like, smaller than one over root n. Like, basically, you can show that sort of, for any regime of the error where, like, this doesn't apply, then the attack will go through for, like, a, a uniform distribution. But we really want the regime where, like, the error is, you know, 0.01, like a constant, for example. There, like, you really have to worry about this. Um, so one other, by the way, I actually would like to go back and make one other quick point. 
So this also explains sort of why like reconstruction attacks don't give like tight lower bounds for differential privacy. The reason is somehow like if you think about this approach, I mean this also prevents a reconstruction attack in the model that I presented on, uh, on Monday, right? Like, in a reconstruction attack, I'm supposed to learn some secret about every person in the data set, and, and by a similar argument, if I'm allowed to add this kind of error that's bigger than, uh, bigger than the kind of statistical noise already in your data set, then there's, there's sort of no way to reconstruct information about everyone. And so, tracing attacks are kind of like, well, very well suited for like understanding this gap. And this gap is like sort of what's really important because there's many problems for which statistically, if you ask, you know, how many samples do I need to infer something about the, pro the probability distribution, that answer is independent of the dimension or has some mild dependence on the dimension. And reconstruction attacks for this reason kind of provably can't show that phenomenon. And tracing attacks, as we'll see, somehow do. Like the fact that you settle for this kind of weaker privacy breach than a reconstruction attack is somehow like the key. So this is like a very kind of, somehow it's like an, an important point. Like this is kind of the, the, the privacy breach that seems to happen in high dimensional statistics, um, even when sort of reconstruction is kind of not, not plausible. Okay. okay, good. So we went through these examples. We explained why like the probability distribution has to have some like there has to be some quantifier. We have to exploit the fact that the algorithm works for all probability distributions and all data sets. And we also explained why we're gonna have to settle for like a weaker inference guarantee, sort of like an asymmetric inference guarantee. So now let's like kind of state the theorem. We're still like getting the you know, exact right statement is, is still quite tricky. But the theorem is almost what you'd expect. So First, we make like a stronger assumption. So we, we're going to in fact assume that like P, the probability distribution, right? So P is itself a random variable. In some machine learning speak, this might be called like a hyper distribution. Like it's a distribution over probability distributions. And We'll talk about sort of exact, I mean, we'll talk about exactly what we like need out of it. It'll sort of fall out of the proof. Like stating it is like really not useful in some sense. Okay, but once you make that assumption, then you can basically say that if the error, if alpha is in, you know, the parameter regime where the Laplace mechanism does not ensure differential privacy, then we get a membership inference or tracing attack where you have kind of High soundness, like if I give you a random person out of the data set, you are very unlikely to think they are in the data set. But then we get this kind of weaker like completeness guarantee. We say there exists someone in the data set that you will identify as in the data set with high probability. And in fact, like you can often say that you can identify more than one, but you know, one is enough to violate privacy. All right. And by the way, notice this is a contradiction when delta is small, like this violates privacy when delta is much smaller than one in n. Right? You could also write the second guarantee as saying that kind of the probability over a random i that the algorithm says in is at least one minus delta over n. Okay, and you're gonna get sort of a privacy violation when delta is much smaller than one minus delta over n. Okay, so this is the theorem, and let me like say a bit about how to prove it. It's, the proof is it's one of those things that looks mysterious, and then you stare at it long enough, and you, like, it looks very like, intuitive, and then you explain to people why it's intuitive, and they're like, are you kidding me? This is really mysterious. So the attack is like very novel, it's totally different. It's you take the target individual, and you take the correlation with the release statistics, Yeah, so I haven't stated it yet, but the idea is that like there's some, you know, like hyper distribution like, you know, P bar or something or P math frac or whatever. Can you give an example of Uniform would be a good one. So so what's important it would be like Wait, what? Exactly. So like 
choose, like, e.g., like, p bar is uniform over negative 1 to plus 1 to the d. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to sample the mean of the population uniformly. So, like, it's a, a p bar is a distribution over product distributions. So the distribution of, like, this distribution is, like, only determined by the mean, because it's a product distribution. And what I'm sampling randomly is the mean of that product distribution. So, like, you know, the first attribute, I give it a random mean between zero, negative 1 and 1. The second attribute, I give it a new independent random mean. Thank you for that insightful question, Adam, to which you clearly didn't know the answer. Um, okay, so that's an example. It, we, you know, there's some general family, uh, but let me, let me, yeah. so the attack uh, is the same attack. It's the same attack. You do the same thing. It's just different analysis. And, you know, let's look at, like, how the attack changes in the noisy case. And the answer is that in the case where the target is independent of the data, like, it just doesn't change much. So, right, we get sort of exactly the same thing that if the target is just a random, you know, sorry, so you get a similar thing. So we say, like, fix p x and q hat. So fix, like, all the randomness except the target. And now the expectation of the target is by definition p. They're a random sample from the population. And so the expectation of the target minus p dot q hat is 0. And just as before, we are going to use the fact that the columns are independent. And so the columns are independent, so this inner product is a sum of independent random variables. We're going to apply Hofting to it. The only thing that changes is that because q hat is not the exact mean, q hat can now sort of live in like a much wider range. Like before we said it's kind of always has entries between negative 1 over root n and positive 1 over root n. Now it can sort of have entries between like negative alpha and alpha. So that changes the threshold a little bit. And that's kind of where we're going to get the, d or the n squared requirement. Okay, but, but like conceptually it's, it's not so different. It's just, you know, you make this observation. You apply Hofding, it's just an exercise. Um, so let's look at completeness. Like that's actually where like the picture really changes. And it really changes precisely because we're not going to be able to say that this test statistic is large for everyone. So the key is to look at the sum over all the people in the data set of the test statistic and show that that sum is bigger than n times the threshold. And then argue, okay, there must exist someone who's above the threshold, but because of these examples where you could, you know, subsample people, it's actually possible there'll just be like one unfortunate person who is like at nt and everyone else is at zero. All right, and now the second idea, which is like, I mean, it's not really like a conceptual idea, it's just like important for how you analyze it, is to go one column at a time. Right, so that, like, similar, you know, in the noiseless case, it was sort of simple enough that we did this kind of as, like, we work directly with vectors. In this case, that's, like, kind of hopeless. You need to work with, like, one column at a time. And you want to argue that each column has some signal, and then you'll apply, like, linearity of, con of expectation over the columns and, and concentration. Um, but, but the sort of in insightful part of the proof is just, like, looking at one column. So let's say now, you know, you have a, like, you have this mean P where this is a random variable, right? Like P is a random variable. And now once you choose P, you choose a data set, which is just a single column vector of length n, where each entry has mean P, okay? And now, like, let's say you wanna, you know, you have some function F, which is, you know, intuitively is kind of like the mean of this column. Like, you're gonna release some function of this column vector and like, we kind of hope it's like the mean, but we can't really ensure that it's like the mean because there can be noise. It could be some other function. Okay, so this is kind of a model of what happens on a data set with one column. So like, this thing is random. These are like IID conditioned on P. 
and like f of x is like sort of maybe similar to the mean. And now, like the key lemma is like this crazy looking thing. So let me kind of unpack what this is. So first, like I'm saying that the like the expectation over just this vector x, I want to get a lower bound on like something, like the expectation of something. So what is the thing I'm getting a lower bound on? Well, f is like intuitively q hat. Like somehow it doesn't make sense in this model to call it q hat, but like intuitively it's q hat. So f is like some approximation to the mean. And now I'm asking like what is the correlation between f of x and the sum of the random variables, but like shifted so they have mean zero. Okay, and notice like that's, that's the test statistic. Like this is just like the expected value of the test statistic. Okay, and what you can show is that if you fix P, then the value of the test statistic is kind of proportional to like how sensitive P, how sensitive the function F is to changes in the population parameter P. Okay, so this is like a very, you know, you have to like stare at this for a while before it makes sense. But it's useful to like think about, you know, think about like an easy case. Like suppose f of x is in fact the mean. Right, so if f of x is the mean, then we can look at this quantity that I'm calling g of p, which is what is the average value of f of x when the mean of x is p? Yeah? So f is a function of x. Yeah, so this is going to hold for like every fixed x. We're going to like average over the random coins. Yeah, no, sorry, right. So this, this is why I kind of don't want to call it like q hat. Like it doesn't exactly correspond to q hat. But like the point is like this is going to hold for every fixed x and then we're going to like average over, over the coins. Okay, good. So like a useful case to keep in mind, as I said, is when f of x is the mean, the true mean. And in this case, you know, if I set p to be some fixed value and I look at like what is the expectation of x on a random draw, like it's exactly p. What that means is that the derivative of like the sensitivity of f this function like, right, so, so I'm calling g prime sort of like the sensitivity of f to p. So like that quantity is just one. And what you can prove with like not too much work is that, right, not surprisingly, that the lemma holds. You can show that in this case, what you get is that the expected value of this is a constant. All right, and like, that's sort of the thing we want to be true more generally. We want it to sort of be more true generally that like for sort of lots of different f's, that's a constant. We want to basically say that as long as f is sort of like correlated with the mean, like f kind of looks like the mean, that this expectation will be constant. All right, and another useful case to keep in mind is like what if f of x just outputs like some fixed p0, like it ignores the data and just outputs p0. Well, in that case, g prime of p is zero. And what you get, and again, it's not so hard to check, is that when the data, like when p really takes the value p0, the correlation will be zero, like your test statistic will be zero. Um, this is why we in fact need like the population parameter p to be, it shows that must be random. Right, like we're sort of only going to, to get um, useful things when p is random because if p is fixed to some constant p0, it's like a perfectly good approximation to the mean. Okay, so this proof is like, what can I say? Like it's a proof, like uh, I'll give you a hint. It's easy to prove if you know some Fourier analysis. You're basically asking like how correlated is f with its individual variables on average. And like when you kind of say it that way, it's like it's exactly what Fourier analysis was like meant to do. But uh, the proof is, is sort of technical and a little annoying. So 
I don't want to do it. You can see I left, I left space for the proof, so I'll just write like proof is obvious. <laughs> So, um, okay, but let's look at what you can do with this lemma. So, suppose that P itself, like the population parameter itself, is a random variable, and I'm gonna draw it from this, like, funny distribution where it's kind of like, you know, more likely to take extreme values. I'm sorry, I drew it. It's not. Sort of more likely to take extreme values, although it's like not, not completely unlikely to take non-extreme values. Right. So, like, why did I choose this distribution? I chose this distribution because it's going to make the calculation really nice. So, oh, sorry. So, what do we what do we know? So, we have this lemma, and what we want to look at is the ex. Oh no, my battery is running low. Uh, just fell out. Okay, so we want the expectation of the test statistic over both the choice of P and over the choice of X. Okay, so we want... This quantity where like the difference is that now I'm also taking the expectation over P. And what that's equal to by our lemma is the expectation over P of G prime P times one over P squared. Right. And what's that equal to? It's equal to the integral from like, say negative one to plus one of G prime P one minus P squared times like normalizing constant over one minus p squared. Right? The density is proportional to one over one minus p squared. I have to put in like some constant to make it a probability distribution. And you know, now you see why I chose this, it's so this goes away. And what I get is just the following. Okay, so when I choose this distribution, what I get is that the expected value of the test statistic for like a single column is equal to some constant times the difference between the average of f on the all ones vector and the average of f on the all, all minus ones vector. Okay, and notice like even if f is very, very noisy, then like this difference is large, right? Because on the all plus ones vector, f better return something like at least one minus alpha. And on the all minus ones vector, it better return something like at most negative one plus alpha. Or else it's you know, not doing anything, like it's not doing anything accurate. So what I get here is I actually get kind of O of one, at least if alpha is alpha is bounded away from one. So I need like the, the minimal possible accuracy. I just need the ability to distinguish all ones from all negative ones. Okay, and then like, of course you can get, you know, a more general statement about like what distributions makes this work and like what is the constant, but that's, that's for Mr. Thomas Steinke to do um, with this integration by parts and black magic. Okay, so this is the gist that if P is drawn from like a suitable distribution, not necessarily the one I told you, so for instance, uniform works pretty much as well, then the expectation of the test statistic on one column is a constant. And by linearity of expectation, that means that the expectation of the test statistic over all D columns is at least D. And now you'd want to apply Hofding. You can't because Q hat could introduce noise in like a way that makes the columns like not independent anymore, right? Like Q could do something silly like, you know, add noise on the fifth column that depends on the value on the second column. However, 
you can if you can just sort of like work it out anyway with I don't know how to I don't know what to tell you like you can still prove that like the equivalent statement is true like uh, no so that's actually the, the magic so you just need the fact that like sort of on average over data sets like for every fixed column sort of on average over like data sets like that column is like accurate. Like you, you need, like you basically need just the guarantee that like, you know, you have an algorithm that takes an arbitrary data set and with high probability adds noise out, you know, at most alpha to like to all the columns. Okay, like you can get even like, you know, slightly weaker things, but the point is that like the definition of accuracy that Laplace gives you that says, you know, for every X, the probability that I add noise bigger than alpha to any column is at most delta, like that's what you need, like you just need that. And then like there's a cute trick that like lets you basically, you know, you have to like go into the proof of Hofding and like apply cute trick somewhere. Uh, that's why it, it's the Hoftingy. It's the little lifeboat that saves you when your concentration inequalities don't succeed. Okay, so at this point it's, it's more algebra, right? It's like we've proven that the test statistic is gonna be sort of bigger than D with significant probability. Therefore, there's like someone whose test statistic is bigger than about d over n, and uh, now you just rearrange the parameters until you get the statement you want. Okay, so I hope like a little of that stuck. At, at the very least, I hope that the fact that there's like cool, like it's like a cool uh, way of analyzing it maybe stuck. Uh, I think that finding like you know, finding the right analysis that sort of gives you exactly like tight statements is like a, a very interesting question. So. So that's the theorem. I put in the slides like just some sort of table of, of results. I want to end with like sort of one thought, which is like why this inner product test. So this is something that might look like a little familiar from like Adam's talk on statistics, which is that suppose you're in like a very nice setting. You have like a known distribution p, and you're just releasing the exact mean. Or in fact, it's not even clear that you have to be releasing the exact mean. Really what you just need is that you know the algorithm that was used to produce the mean. Like there is a specific algorithm. So notice like we like use this inner product test which only uses like very limited information about P and about Q. Like it, it doesn't really like know anything about like where they come from. But there's actually like a better thing to do in this simple setting. And Adam sort of like mentioned it in his talk. What you can do is you can look at the ratio of the likelihood. So you look at your target and you basically say, what is the probability that my target came from the data set X versus the probability that my target came from the data set X conditioned on X having a specific mean. Okay, and then this is where I, what I mean when I say that it's not crucial that Q is the mean, it's just that it has to be some known function. Okay, so it turns out that like, the, the optimal membership inference task, uh, test takes this form. This is something called the Neyman Pearson lemma. So for every P and every fixed algorithm Q, like this is the optimal test. So like you can trade off kind of false positives and false negatives, but like you can't dominate this test. But notice like this test needs to actually like know the algorithm. So if I take this test and instead of using Q of X, I use some Q prime of X, this test is just gonna like go bonkers. Like it's gonna give you stupid things. Whereas this inner product test is like very robust. And I think that's like a, like a very like interesting phenomenon to explore. So like Adam was sort of saying in these settings where you really know like you're deciding between one of two things, like T comes from, from X, T comes from, the, uh, from P, we really like know what hypothesis testing looks like and you can in fact show that like, you know, you can show empirically that this likelihood ratio would do much better than what I proved at least up to constants. Like asymptotically it's the right theorem, but like it's concrete performance is better. We don't, to my understanding, like we, there's really like nothing we can say about sort of like, like what is the right test if you want this kind of you know additional quantifier over like all noisy means or even like all means in some class. Like you know we really just don't have like any sense of what is like the right test. And I think you know like tying this back to sort of what Vitali talked about. I mean this is very much like, you know if you want to sort of push this stuff into like to drive these like, you know, membership inference attacks in practice, of course you want like not just the asymptotics, you want like the right test. And you know, the better tests you have, like the more you can sort of dissuade people from doing the wrong things in practice. 
I think this is an interesting question. Uh, here's a, a little plot due to Adam. So let me just, what's going on in this plot? So what's happening is there's like two algorithms you can use. The first algorithm is just like take the mean and do some rounding. Adam's like disowned this plot already. It's a great plot. I didn't write the tweets that go with it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm editorializing a little. Um, okay, so you can do two things. You can either like take the mean exactly. This is the setting where the log ratio test was like designed for. Like this is like the correct thing that the log ratio test was built around. Or you can take the statistics and you can just like round them. Right? Like you don't do anything clever for privacy, you just like truncate the values. And what's going on is so like this is a precision recall plot, so you want to go up and left. I'm definitely gonna do the like our plot, their plot thing. Like up left is good, down right is bad. So the blue line in the top left is the log ratio test on like exact statistics, like on the thing it was designed for. And it's like crushing it. Like you literally like can't go further left, at least at like pixel resolution to what it does. Okay. This like yellow line, like here, this yellow line, is the inner product test on like exact statistics. So it's on a setting that like it's on the same setting where the log ratio test was designed for, and it's still like pretty good. Like it's not as good as the log ratio test, but it's like pretty, pretty good. Now, like way down to the right is what happens if you run the log ratio test on a setting it wasn't designed for. And like you can you know debate whether this was like the right way to run it, but like you know the point is like if you just take your code and you click go, like as Vitali says, this is what people would do in practice. Like you get something literally worse than random. Like it's just an it's an embarrassment to membership inference ta tests. Whereas the robust test is the red line. Like it's still doing pretty good. Like your rounding to the nearest multiple of one tenth like has not really deterred it from membership inference. And one tenth, that's like a lot of noise, right? Like one tenth is like way bigger than the signal in like any real data set. So this is just demonstrates the phenomenon I'm talking about. And I think like just understanding this is like a really like interesting question. And sort of a related question to this is understanding not just the role of like knowing knowledge of the algorithm, but also like the knowledge of the distribution. So like, like just the general question of kind of like how much do you need to know about the environment in which the attack is, is operating? Like Vitaly gave you know this whole explanation of how they actually like generated the data necessary to kind of learn what do people in the test set look like, and like how you know this was a whole process for him, and you know we're working in much simpler models, so we can actually hope to get like a nice like statement about how do we how can we generate people that we can use to sort of train and calibrate what we're doing, you know in our model like in our model the role that was was the role played by knowledge of the population distribution. So we can show some things about like what you need to know about the population distribution, but it's very you know, vague. Um, so I think those are great questions. I think there's a lot to say kind of bridging what I just talked about with, with what Vitaly talked about in the deep learning oracle model. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Feel free to ask me more questions after the talk and uh, I will end now, 12.45. Thank you.